Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we discover the silver lining in life's most difficult stories. I'm your host, Toby Dore. Hi, Jean. I'm so delighted to have you today on my podcast. You have such an interesting history. I think it's going to be so much fun. Uh, Before we start, can you tell me what your favorite color is and why? My favorite color is black. (laughs) Um, Well, only on certain... I mean, I love black because it kind of... it, It neutralizes everything and it sort of... It's kind of like a great equalizer. Um, I also would say that red, I like red. And you can see, I have red glasses. You like red, too. So, so Yes, you do. You do. Yeah. Red definitely makes a statement. That's for sure. So I came across you on your LinkedIn profile, and I don't know how it got shown to me, but it was perfect that it did. Uh, I see that you do a lot of work with people in prison and that you're an activist and you've written quite a few books, uh, which I have two of your books here. And I understand you have a new book coming out uh, in March of 2024. So we'll talk about that, too. Um, Can you tell me what's the hardest decision you've ever had to make? I think it was a very hard decision uh, not having children. Oh, um, yeah. But it That's was a, a decision, decision based on, at the time, I really felt that I couldn't do the work that I do and have kids. I think many women mm-hmm. do that. And many, I mean, women should be able to mm-hmm. do that obviously, but I didn't feel I could. And um, I don't feel a loss because I have fed fabulous nieces and nephews and, and I also have their children, mm-hmm. but it was a hard decision for my husband and I. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I could see that. And and tell us a little bit about the work that you do do. The well, work my, my is work is really working with people who, I began working with people in prison and um, in, I guess it was 1987 when I first taught in prison. And I, it changed me. It turned me into a prison activist and, and it turned me into a writer. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't have been writing uh, as much as I've been writing if I didn't have something to write about. And in that sense, I'm very lucky Mm -hmm. because there's so much, I mean, unfortunately, there's so much injustice with my top, but I do have a lot to write about. And that I began with actually working in a prison and now I work with people on probation. I do a lot of work about people on parole and most of my work is writing books and articles as opposed to actually being on the front lines, which I did for 10 years inside. And then I I also work with people on probations and that's on the front lines too, but I still do that. Mm -hmm. What, what did you do when you worked in the prison? I first taught college classes at Framingham women's prison in Massachusetts. And then I also directed plays. I directed eight plays and you were mentioning you have one of my books and that is about the directing of, of, of plays. Yes. So I do have that book here. It's called Shakespeare and it shouldn't Behind scare people. Bars. It I shouldn't scare so people, Toby, to because it's yeah. not really about Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I wrote some, I made some Ooh. notes of some quotes from the book when I started reading it. Um, and you said that you believe that if my students tackled Shakespeare, a writer they thought beyond reach they would also be learning to take on what was yeah. most difficult in life. That is so profound mm-hmm. and so insightful. And, you know, I served 27 months in prison myself, and there truly is nothing to do in there. 
There's nothing to do. And women are just yearning. And you actually said this, that the women yearned for change and growth. And you do. You look for some purpose in your day. And if I could see you coming in and doing a class on putting plays on behind bars or reading Shakespeare, women would be all over that because it gives them a purpose. It gives them something to do. And I love that you could see that beyond just reading Shakespeare, they would learn to take well, on Well, we actually did put on, we actually put on um, eight productions and we put them on for the prison. And part of what was engaging for the women, well, first of all, reading, as you said, reading the text, interpreting the text, and that mm -hmm. was not easy. Uh, but interpreting the text and then staging the text. And that was yet another amazing part of the process because uh, one of the things I also realized about the women I worked with is they were incredibly inventive and all the skills that they had on the street mm -hmm. that in some ways, some of the skills that had gotten them in trouble, their risk-taking skills, skills, their mm -hmm. risk-taking once you take uh -huh. risks with theater, you're taking risks or education too. You're taking risks in a different way than you are when you're taking risks with the, in on the street. And that is, I think, what I learned about the women is that, you know, they could, they could, they could improvise, they could make up things, and that worked on stage. But it might not work on the street mm -hmm. because it might get them in trouble. But it worked on stage, and it so it gave them an outlet for that exactly. creativity and, that, and innovation, and, and also that part of them that that was kind of you know what somebody would have said you're a real con. Well, that that's an advantage on the stage. <laughs> you want to make somebody yes, believe? Yes, yes, that's true. Because you are trying to make that's them exactly think that you're right. someone yeah. you're not. Yeah, I love that. And I imagine I can just, you know, picture being a woman who had an opportunity to perform in a play while I was in prison. And that would give me freedom, you know, uh, that to be somewhere else besides just being in prison. When you get to take on that role and, and portray a life, you kind of right. feel free while you're doing that. So I think that's really powerful. A couple of the other quotes that I read from your book was that, you know, eventually the program took on a philosophy that art has the power to redeem lives. And that is so powerful. And there's so few opportunities inside prisons, really, for art to happen. So um, I could see the value in that. You also said that you came to realize that most women in prison are not dangerous, what characterizes them more than anything else is their heartache. Instead of frightening me, they seemed lost with tragic lives. And, you know, I formed the deepest friendships I've ever had in my life with the women I was in prison with. And I think it's because we're at our lowest point and, and we all need support. And so we lean on each other. And I, that really binds you tightly together, I think. I found, you know, being in prison was not fun. I don't want to do it again. But in some ways, it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had because of the You know, you're not alone in saying women. that, Toby. Um, the person who I wrote the second book about, we'll get to him in a little bit, but, but his name is Carter Reed, and he mm -hmm. told me the same thing, that the closest friendships he ever had were people he met behind bars, the deepest conversations he ever had were with people he met behind bars. Yes. Yes, they are because, you know, everything's out on the table there and people are vulnerable. And so they aren't afraid. You know, there's times, there are stories of times in prison when if you're too vulnerable, you'll get taken advantage of. But I, especially in the women's prison, I didn't see that. Yeah, I think it's often. different women and men. And that's, you know, there was an article um, I read and I, I can't remember who wrote this. A uh, woman in prison is not a dangerous man. And um, I don't think a dangerous man in prison is a dangerous man. But I mean, I, I think that most right. men mm -hmm. are, many men um, are not dangerous too. And I think we, we mislabel the people who go to prison by men and women for the most part. 
Huh? Yeah, I think so, too. And I was just reading in your second book, Boy with a Knife, which I have here, too. I was reading in the epilogue, Carter had gone to college and had graduated with a 4.0 and was invited to be in the honor roll, the national honor roll. And he had to fill out the paperwork, but it said if you'd been convicted of a felony or were on parole within the last two years, right. you couldn't be allowed right. in. And, and he was you know on what? I protested parole, that. So. And they've, I think they've changed. Yeah, they've changed. Oh, did policy. you? Yeah. Oh, that that's was a good. policy with the, um, with uh, that, that f you couldn't get into National Honor Society, but you can now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that was That's horrible. Excellent. Horrible. I'm glad to see that And happen. the other thing that happened to Carter mm -hmm. is he couldn't, they wouldn't let him tutor. He g went to a community college. He got, as you said, 4.0. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you mm -hmm. can't do better than a 4.0. But then uh, somebody asked him if he wanted to uh, teach, not teach, but tutor. And he wanted to, and he would be paid for it, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let him do it at that college is horrible, um, really, because um, that is, you know, yeah, you know, I feel like when we go to court, society tells us what they want from us for the crime we committed. And when we give them that, when they release us from prison because they say you've completed whatever we wanted from you, your right. debt should be paid. You shouldn't have to drag it around with I you agree. for the rest of your life. <clears throat> But it does happen. And, you know, like I've come into there's like Canada won't let you come into the country if you've been arrested. And it's like, well, I'm not a danger. I'm truly not a danger to Canada. But it just seems silly that you're excluded from going to visit my friend who lives in Nova Scotia because is that, is that I've true been in, in other prison. countries, too? But, yes, there are. There's a list of countries. Um England is one. I had uh, a news show that wanted to fly me to England and have me on their morning show, but I couldn't go because England won't let you in if you wow, didn't have a felony conviction. So it is it's pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah, you right. just pay for and your crimes forever. That's what Michelle There's Alexander no said in her. I'm sure you must have read that book, The New Jim Crow. Um, okay, it, it's a very no, important I haven't, book, but I'm putting that the on New my Jim list Crow. Right now. <clears throat> color blindness in the incarceration in the age of color blindness, mass incarceration. I can't remember the subtitle, mm -hmm. but it's called the new Jim Crow and it's really an important book. And she does say that people who, who have been incarcerated are like people who went through the new Jim Crow in the South. They supposedly have their rights, mm -hmm. but a lot is still taken yeah. away. You can't vote, you know, there, I mean, mm -hmm. for a long, many states, yeah. you can't, there are things you can't do, like you just mm -hmm. mentioned in terms of travel, um, you, some mm -hmm. people with housing, they won't let you get housing and all sorts of things like that. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, I have lived in two or three states since I've been out of prison. I've been out of prison. Well, my crime was 17 and a half years ago. It's been a while. I've been out since May of 2009. I No, May of 2008. So really, it's a long time ago. And I have voted in every election until two years ago, we moved to Virginia with my stepson and his family. He came here for a government job and we moved with him and we share a house which works great for the grandkids. And I didn't know it till I went to register to vote, but Virginia is one of three states in the country that bans felons from voting for life. I, I could vote two years ago in Missouri. I'm the same person that cast my vote then. So how can I not cast my vote now? Totally. I mean, it's just crazy. Some of the things on the books. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to be able to make a difference with that at some point here, too. Uh, you said a couple of things. I made some uh, notes of some quotes from the Boy with a Knife book, which if you want to give sure. us a little bit of a background of that okay, story, so why don't you go ahead? I um, was teaching at a community college in Massachusetts. Uh, 
I, I taught, I, I am now emerita, emerita, but I taught there for uh, 26 years. And when I was teaching there, um, I, one day, you know, I'd written Shakespeare Behind Bars. I got a letter uh -huh. from a young man named Carter Reed. Well, he wasn't that young at the time, but to me, he was young. He was, I guess, 30, 31, something like 32. And he was mm -hmm. asking for some help about parole for a friend of his who was in prison. And he had found my book, Shakespeare Behind Bars, in the prison library. And he wrote me this letter oh. and very inventive. <laughs> and he said, I don't, I know you might think this is terrible. I don't like Shakespeare. And he went on and he told me more about himself and what he was looking <laughs> for. Anyway, of course, I Googled him. And, you know, typical of what mm -hmm. happens when you Google someone, up comes the most horrible things about Carter. You know, mm -hmm. he killed someone when he was 16, stormed into a classroom, you know, monster, you know, all these terrible things about this this person in, when he was 16, you know, calling him all of this. And yeah. I thought, wow, the person on the page here is writing me a letter does not sound like this, quote, monster that they're describing. So I was curious. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't know what to do, if I should write him back or not. Um, and I went to my class that I had at the time called Voices Behind Bars, the Literature of Prison, a class I had created at the college. And I read the letter to my students mm -hmm. and I said, what do you think I should do? And they said, you have to write him back. We want to know more about him. So thus began my <laughs> correspondence with Carter. And I ended up writing to him for six years. And I was not an intentional wow. thing. But Carter is incredibly articulate. And he needed to write to people. And I became someone who he could talk to and write to. And we talked about incarceration and i i used him in in my class i let him be like a lecturer in the sense that i read his letters to my mm -hmm. class and um i went to visit him and i decided i would write a book about him because i was appalled that somebody 16 could go to an adult prison and that's what i began researching how we mm -hmm. incarcerate children and why we send people like Carter. Now, Carter, the prosecutor at the time, I mean, Carter's crime was horrible. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, it mm -hmm. was a horrible crime. Mm -hmm. He went into yeah. a classroom with two friends. Mm -hmm. Carter thought he was going to be a hero. He had a knife with him. There was, they were trying to settle a fight and they went into a classroom and they ended up attacking a boy who was not the boy. I mean, he was a part of the group, but not the main person they were looking for mm -hmm. carter stabbed mm -hmm. him in a classroom now i'm a teacher so wow this is pretty it was appalling mm -hmm. and anyway with one stab room the wound the boy died jason robinson it wow. was a terrible tragedy and carter the mm -hmm. prosecutors tried to paint him as someone who had done this with malice deliberately they asked for first degree murder which would have been uh, life without parole. He did not get life without parole. He mm -hmm. got life with parole, eligibility to see parole in 15 years. But he was sent when he was, he first was in, you know, by the time, you can't go to an adult prison until you're 18. So he was in another place until he turned 18. And then they sent him to an adult prison. And he served, wow. you know, that, <clears throat> well, 20 almost 20 years before he got out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so uh, there's a quote from that book you write these boys and girls barely having earned their driver's license too young to vote too young to legally buy alcohol or cigarettes are locked away with adult men and women this in spite of the fact that 90 percent of juveniles even those convicted of murder grow out of criminal right. behavior as they age. I mean, there, there's no justification for it. And, you know, I feel 
criminal justice system should be about rehabilitation. Well, ma- many it, states it's not, really. are are trying to do, I mean, we have a lot of laws now that won't let kids go to prison for life. But there mm-hmm. are states that mm-hmm. still um, send kids to adult prisons. There are states that, um, I mean, Mass- in Massachusetts, if you kill someone, or if you're accused of kill, murdering someone as young as 14, you will go to prison if you are convicted. Uh, um, eventually, wow. you will be in an adult prison. Um, so mm-hmm. in other states, it's a, you know, I think as young as 12, some people, you don't go there necessarily until you turn a little bit older, but you still can be convicted at as a young person. Mm-hmm. And I just want to you know, say, one thing I want to say, how can Carter you would be mad at me? Uh-huh. He served more than 20 years. He's <laughs> 20 years plus. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And 20 years is a long time. I mean, it, I did an episode a, a while back on, and I interviewed four men who had been convicted of a murder here in Washington, D.C., that, it's obvious they didn't commit, although the, the government will never say that they were wrongly convicted. They served their whole sentences and got out. And they were kids, 16 and 18, and the oldest one was 24 yeah. when they went to prison. And you, you kind of stall out, I think, mentally and emotionally at the age you right. are when you get incarcerated. And it's really hard to mature healthily. And, you know, the majority of people who are in prison will get out someday. And so it's so, to society's best interest that we release them better people well, than when they came in. I think that, that should be prison our goal. doesn't, as we constructed prison the way it is now, it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve people. Uh, you know, the fact that no. most people who are 55, and older are considered elderly in prison shows you the kind of conditions they're mm-hmm. living in. I mean, it's 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 mm-hmm. not like in European countries where you live in a civilized place where you have a like a hotel room where you can use the water, where you can swim. You know, it's it's just um, it's brutal, and conditions are brutal. I mean, think of what people are mm-hmm. going through mm-hmm. in the heat in tech in prisons. Yes. Yeah. And right. and Arizona and California, a lot of those prisons right. are not air conditioned and you don't have a window. You we can just open. had an article so, in the paper about, you know, 90 degree temperatures behind bars, 100 degrees and so on. I mean, mm-hmm. it's been brutal when it's hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that goes into cruel and unjust. You know, it's just not right. There's so many things. So. What are the issues nearest and dearest to your heart when it comes to the uh, criminal justice system? Well, I'm very interested in parole, and I'm interested in Mm -hmm. how we treat people on parole and how we should treat people on parole. I find, you know, the whole idea of what happens when you get out of prison has become very interesting to me, how to help people get back into society and how poorly we do it really i think parole is actually Mm -hmm. um you know i think the idea of lifetime parole is is crazy people don't need to don't need to be on parole for their whole life no um no i mean if they have a problem when they're on parole they're going to send them back to prison so after a certain amount of time of having no problems you ought to Except the yeah, fact that so they're not a problem. I guess the other thing is I wanted to, t- well, I, we're going to talk about my new book, but I also have a novel that I'm writing. And and uh, I'll talk oh. about that first, and then I'll talk about the book that's coming out. But the novel gets to one okay. of the things, as you asked, what was nearest and dearest to my house. This year, one of the things that was really striking to me is, I don't know if you followed this Toby, but this case in California of rampant sexual abuse in women's prisons. Oh, yes, I have read some of that. It is 
And it, it's appalling it's to me. Yeah. The mm-hmm. in this Dublin women's prison in California that the both the chaplain and the uh, superintendent were both accused of sexual abuse. Yeah, the chaplain. The chaplain. And and as, oh as well my. as the guards, of course. But the kind mm-hmm. of sexual, you know, mm-hmm. the fact that men guard women and the fact that particularly in women's prison, not that there's not abuse in men's prisons, but Mm -hmm. the abuse in women's prisons is so terrible. So the novel I wrote deals with that. Um, Yeah. It it actually takes a case I read in the paper of a correction officer who kills her abusive husband and ends up in the awaiting trial unit, has to deal with being a correction officer and realizes Uh, how she's seen the world wrong as a correction officer and begins mm -hmm, to become, gets mm -hmm. to be close to one of the women, friends with one of the women behind bars, and they help spur on a Me Too, spur on a a movement. um, Oh, excellent. To deal with the abuse, and that's what the novel, I haven't sold it yet, but I'm hoping to... um, Somebody will want to publish it, and I'll get an agent. Does yes, it have a title, yes, or a is title. it possible called, the title will change? Um, okay. Sounds like trouble to me. I love that. Well, I have to I sell can't it wait first, for it but to that's, come out. I've been working on that in the pandemic. Yeah. But you asked what was near and dear to my heart. I mean, obviously, um, mm-hmm. what goes on with women which is what I've start, which is how I started working in prison is still really important. Uh-huh. I also do a group uh-huh. um, called changing lives through literature, which is a group of women on probation. And those women, we, what the, it's kind of a unique program. The women read books kind of like a, just like a book group, but the book group is made up of a judge, a probation officer, women who are on probation and a facilitator, i.e. me. And we all talk on an equal level about a book. I love that idea. It's so much How fun. And the that? women love it. And the mm-hmm. judge <clears throat> listens to them. I mean, it's really great when we have women judges, sometimes male judges, but mm-hmm. um, I've done this program for many, many years um, since mm-hmm. 1990. Two. Do you do you meet in well, we person meet or in do you meet virtually? all up till the pandemic? Uh, we didn't meet mm-hmm. during the pandemic, and I'm going to start up again. Um, hopefully, the fall, maybe the spring, meeting in person. Mm-hmm. I think that's awesome. Well, you yeah, guys are but in the Boston programs area. Programs all over Boston, actually. Um, there used to be programs all over the country, but the guy, the person who started this mm-hmm. program, Bob Waxler and Bob, uh, and Judge Kane, uh, Robert Kane, they don't do it any longer. And sort of the some of the impetus to get it started in other states got lost. I mean, a lot of people in different states go in and use literature behind bars, but this is radical in terms mm-hmm. of having right. I love that. I love that. I would love to come to one of those meetings. You might have to I might come to Massachusetts. Have to see if I can make yeah. that work. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I've been to Boston College a couple of times. I've spoken to some students there and they're considering using my memoir for their oh, that's freshman cool. class. What is your in memoir a year called, so. Toby? So uh, it's called oh, that's uh, right. Living with that's Conviction. That's what the name of your book is. Yeah. yeah. I great. have a copy of it right here. Yeah. Yeah. Living with Conviction. So, it's my story of making it through prison and rebuilding my life. And um, actually, I've had a couple book clubs read my book, and then I call into a Zoom call with them after they're finished so they can ask me questions that's that they good way of have it. after yeah, reading that's it that they didn't feel like they had answers to. Yeah, yeah, I think it works great. I just love that idea. I think that's awesome. So, uh, so we have Shakespeare Behind Bars. We have Boy with a Knife. Hopefully someday we're going to have sounds like trouble to me. 
And in March of 2024, we're going to have another well, book. One and what just, is that I'm very one excited to talk to you about. It's called Mother Love. And it's a book oh, of yeah. short stories. And each story is about a woman whose child has killed someone. Oh, my gosh. I so love it's the, what that the mothers idea. go through living mm-hmm. with what their the children have done. And so or et cetera. Yes. So it, it's mm-hmm. 10 mothers and 10 stories. And when I talk about it, I'm going to invite different mothers to come with me who really mm-hmm. have gone through that because. Mm-hmm. And I, I love and I'll tell that you, idea. The thing that's really phenomenal, it's being published by this press that's Concord Free Press. It's in Massachusetts. Now, get this. This is going to knock your socks off. So Concord Free Press, their business model is different from most publishers. What they do is they mm-hmm. let's say they print twenty five hundred books. OK, They give Mm -hmm. the books away and they ask only that you make a donation to whatever charity you want to give it to. Really? And so they each book has made like $40,000 for charity. So instead of me getting money, my book will raise money for other people. I love that idea. I love that idea. I'm going to have to check them out. I might. Yeah, I love that. I might see if I can get someone from there to oh, be on that my would, line Yeah, my Stona podcast. or Anne. They're both wonderful yeah. people. Right. Stona uh, or They're Anne. wonderful people. And um, it's a very interesting idea because, I mean, the truth is most mm-hmm. books, unless you're famous, don't make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So who cares if you get right. $2,000 from a book? Uh, you know, it's not like... Mm-hmm. It and it's sort of it. It at least for this point in my life, it feels like a great thing to do. You know, I also think mm-hmm. the book would make a fabulous mini series, but that's another story. Right, I love that idea. Wow, that's pretty cool. I really so like m- that. That just kind of blows my I, mind. When the, the when, book yeah, and the press, the press. And by the time yeah. your podcast comes out um, with me on it, I think people will be able to go to that press's website in March and you order the, you Mm -hmm. get, you just go on their website and you, at that point you'll be able to get my book in March and they send it to you free. Wow. They send it to you. Oh my God. And all they ask is that you make a donation to where, wherever you'd like to make a donation Mm -hmm. and you let them know. And you can do it anonymously. You don't have to tell them how much money you gave. You can mm-hmm. do it any way you want. Mm-hmm. And they also say if you want to just do something charitable, like, you know, you're going to go to a nursing home and, and help out for a day, something like that, that's considered mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something that giving to charity. Wow. <laughs> what a great idea. That I know. Just, not to talk I, I, I know. I'm just almost speechless from that. I just love it. I just love it. So, Jean, who has been your most important mentor? Uh, Well, I have several mentors. One was a writing teacher of mine who is still writing. His name is Robert Ray. And when I was at Beloit College, when I was young, I didn't know. Well, I was in college, obviously. I didn't know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Not that anybody does anything that they, mm-hmm. <laughs> they plan to do. I thought, do I want to be, at the time, I want to be an actress. Do I want to be a writer? What do I want to do? Because I always loved theater. And he told me mm-hmm. that I could be a writer. And I, you know, it was an amazing gift he gave me because it wasn't something that I had really believed about myself. Um that I could be a writer. And I, I at the time, um, I wrote poetry the most. And I got into Iowa Writers mm-hmm. Workshop waitlist to, to be a poet. I could, which is a really prestigious. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't go there. Yes, it is. And I, I didn't get into mm-hmm. Yale Drama School. You know, I didn't. So I became a hippie. I went to California. I didn't. 
you know, I eventually <laughs> did go to Brandeis Graduate School in acting. And I got into writing as I, I, I got into writing when I had something to say after I worked in a prison. That's when yes. I got into writing. And now mm -hmm. I've written actually, um, well, this will be my seventh book that I'm publishing. I have a book of poetry and then some books mm -hmm. of um, that relate to the Changing Lives program. So, um, but what I wanted to say about Robert Ray is that he helped me to believe in myself. That's the first, that yes, was one. That is so then I important. had, I would say, mm -hmm. my, there was a woman who, was a singing teacher of mine. She's no longer alive, Tina Rolf. And when I went to Brandeis, I did not have much confidence. I was short. I was, you know, I didn't look like, I sort of imagined I'm going to be Hedda Gabler. I'm going to be a great dramatic actor. <laughs> yes. And, I, and they uh -huh. always told me, you know, <clears throat> you're, you're, you have to be a comedy Star. You can, you're short. You have to be a comedian. I, I didn't want to be a comedian. Yes. Although I'm funny. Yes. You well, had powerful things so to say. Tina, yeah. Um, when I went to her, she told me I had an incredibly beautiful singing voice and as good as anybody mm. who came to her from Brandeis. And that, wow. what that did for me again is instill confidence in me. Because, mm -hmm. And that's so important because when you believe you can do it, you can do it. My parents instilled confidence in me too. They were, they, they loved mm -hmm. me. They told me I could do anything, but I chose to do things that are hard to do. The arts are hard and you're rejected all the time and you have to have an attitude of like, so who cares? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So what's the name of your oh, poetry it's called book? Almost Home Free. And it was actually I like that, too. I published oh, a book of poetry, wow. too. This is mine. It's called You're Not oh, Your Worst good. Mistake. Poems from oh, Prison. So these are all poems from my fabulous. prison journals. Uh, yeah. Well, mine was when so. I, I after I had breast cancer <clears throat> and um, which I did in 2001. Ah. Uh, my treatment was 2001. And actually, mm -hmm. Toby, uh, mm -hmm. that my book was a way of writing myself through the cancer, probably in some ways, like your writing got yes. you through prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Yeah, I found, you know what I love most about poems are the things that aren't said. Poetry gives you space to fill in the blanks. And I just find poetry to be so soul touching you know it just wow it was I wonderful i had taken studied poetry and i po i always say poetry is my first mm -hmm. language you know like the sl the prose, <laughs> prose is yes. my second uh -huh. language but i think poetry comes to you when you need to say something that comes so deep from the heart that you can't say it unless you do it in a poem. That's how I experience it. Right, because prose, there's too much to it. It takes away the emotion. You know, there's just, you know, when I wrote all these poems in prison, <clears throat> I never studied poetry, but right. I just wrote how I felt. And, and you needed to, you needed to say I just in a certain it. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And you could say them in a poem when you couldn't really write them out because there's just something different about it. I don't know what it is, but I just love poetry. So I think that's just amazing. Uh, all these projects that you've been busy with. So tell us about a significant event in your life that knocked you down and how did you, pick well, let's talk up? about cancer. Um, yeah, that'll definitely uh, do it. <clears throat> it was in 2000. I was in Texas and my husband is from Texas, and we'd gone to visit his family, and mm -hmm. we were going to sleep, and I felt something that felt unusual in my breast. And I, mm -hmm. I, we, we really couldn't get diagnosed until I got home. 
And mm-hmm. I was shocked. I had not, it came like, what? It was just out of the blue. I was totally taken aback. Mm-hmm. And what happened really was um, I just had to walk through it step by step by step in order to mm-hmm. uh, get the treatment. And really, one of the things that, well, of course, my husband was incredibly amazing. Uh, and not all husbands mm-hmm. are incredibly amazing. <laughs> That's but true. my mm-hmm. my husband was yeah. he's so funny because he said after a year he said okay we're done now you know he said <laughs> <laughs> you've been the center of, of attention for years but but uh-huh. he was he helped me through it I had chemo I mean this were the days mm-hmm. when you had to go into the hospital to have chemo and have radiation chemo mm-hmm. was not as bad as radiation for me but. You asked how I picked myself up. I would say writing, friends, Mm -hmm. family, Mm -hmm. jelly beans. Uh, Well, jelly (laughs) Jelly beans, beans. those little little ones. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I I, I tried to, I bought wigs. You know, I tried to be normal. I was teaching. I wanted Mm -hmm. to be normal. Um, I mean, I... I would cry at home. I would talk to my husband. I'd take off my wig. I'd have my bald head. And then I'd uh-huh. go to exercise class with my new wig on. I'd do whatever I needed to do. I'd go teach. Uh, you know, one of my students would come and help me carry my books all the time to my class. You know, I mm-hmm. <clears throat> I learned a lot during that. I learned a lot. Yes. Yeah. Did you I have? You did do. you get sick? I I had thyroid cancer. Yeah, and you know, that's what made me start the prison dog program that I started because, you know, it just kind of shocked me. Cancer, me, and you think, well, I haven't done anything worthwhile yet, so I better get busy doing something good. And I started the prison dog program after that. So, which got me into trouble <laughs> because I helped one of my dog oh. handlers escape from prison. Uh, that was my crime. And, uh, and I did 27 months, which is not a long prison sentence, but it felt long. I think it's a me. long time. <laughs> it's two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's two years. Yeah, it is a long time. And You know, in this book, Boy with a Knife, and uh, Carter was talking about institutionalization. I was in prison for 27 months. Some people are in prison for 10 or 20 or 30 years. I'm telling you, it took me a good eight months to get back into being a citizen. My brother took me to the movies the first weekend I was out, and I had a panic attack. I mean, it was dark in that movie theater, and it's never dark in prison. And there's all these kinds of people sitting behind you, chomping on food and wrestling around, and you don't know who's back there. And, oh, I I couldn't do it. I couldn't go to the movies. Uh, It's just crazy how different you see the world. Still, there's still some things that linger, and it's been 17 years. So I I really really understand that. Um, And there was one of the women who you, you, Dolly, the one of the women in my book, when she got out, she was on parole, mm-hmm. and I used to visit her. And she lived in mm-hmm. senior housing. And she told me that whenever she went into the bathroom, she looked behind her to see if anyone was there. She always felt that way, that yeah. she never knew who was going to mm-hmm. come. You know, she lived in a self Come up on you. That uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does definitely change you. So I love all the work that you're doing. I think it's just amazing. I cannot wait for your two new books to come out. So you'll well, have to be sure and let me know. Okay, I want but to be you one can of the get, first to get one. You'll be able to get, uh, you'll go on that Concord Free Press. Concord Free Press, Concord website, Free Press right. And you will be able to uh, order a book from them and they, and then you will read it and, you know, pass it on. Okay. 
I'll put a link to their website well, in the show notes yeah. for this podcast too. So yeah. people be able to go out there and, and uh, get a copy. Uh, let's see. Was there ever a time you really felt imprisoned and what did you do to free yourself? Well, I mean, I, I was married before I'm married now. And I did ah. mm -hmm. feel, I don't want to say that he did anything to make me feel trapped. Because uh -huh. he didn't. He wasn't uh -huh. abusive. Nothing like that. But I felt... Uh -huh. I felt I was trapped in a relationship that I... That was not that what I wasn't that I wanted to grow in different ways that I wasn't growing and mm -hmm. and even though I loved him I was I I married him I was too young and I guess that was the feeling mm -hmm. of uh, being trapped. Well, uh, Mm -hmm. You know, there were times when I was growing up that I felt like I didn't belong in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I grew up. And I did leave. I mean, I loved my family. I loved, uh -huh. you know, I think there are times when you can leave and there are times when you can't leave. I mean, that's what I think is the, actually mm -hmm. what makes prison is that you can't leave. Uh, so right. both of those situations, I was eventually able to leave. Uh Certainly, one, they both required different kinds of difficulty. Uh, but but those were be feeling trapped, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can relate. Um, I was married, my husband. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. He wants to use the ice maker. Go ahead. I'm going to stop talking and okay. Mark can cut this part out. Did you get your eyes? Okay. He's got his eyes. Okay. Sorry. Um, my first message or my first marriage, I was married for 28 years to the boy I started dating when I was 15. And we married when we were 20. And he was a decent guy and I was a decent person, but the two of us together yeah. was not a happy marriage, you know? And, and, it was even, it was almost harder because if he, it had been a bad marriage, if something terrible had happened, you would have justification to leave. But when you can't quite put your finger on what it is that's not right, it's I identify really hard with to that. I mean, leave. that was part of what was my problem mm -hmm. too. But I think, you know, I always say to my students imagine you're in an elevator and you get stuck. And you don't have your mm -hmm. cell phone. Mm -hmm. That's the closest. Yes. You know, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. You just kind of have to stay there. And, and, and yeah. somebody's going to yeah, let you I can out. I relate to that. And you're at the mercy of mm -hmm. the somebody. Mm -hmm. I think being yeah, at the mercy so of somebody is also what defines incarceration, too, because, you know, People give you, you know, the, if you're trapped in an elevator, you will do almost anything to get out of that elevator. And so mm -hmm, when people right. don't understand what people go through and what they'll do for anything when they're incarcerated, I mm -hmm. ask them to think about that. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's definitely true. So what's one question you wish I'd ask? There's something thinking, else you want to share with really us? I mean, you're pretty good at asking <laughs> everything. Um, maybe how did I start working in a prison? Yes, I like that. I like that. Tell us how that got it was started a fluke. doing that. Um, hmm. <laughs> I love flukes. Uh, some of the it's best true. things come out of so flukes, So much of my I life think. has been like that, actually, <laughs> to be honest with you, Toby. Following one thing leading to another, not a plan. But I was taking a poetry class, and a very, very dear friend, who turned out to be a dear friend, she um, 
was offered teaching a class in a prison and she didn't have enough room in her schedule to do it. And so she said, do you oh, want to do it? Okay. And I said, you know, oh, sure. Why not? Because it was a college class at the time I was teaching high school. And I thought, wow, teaching a college class in a prison, that'll be more prestigious than teaching high school. And, mm. you know, so I said, <laughs> sure. And I, I literally, the, I had maybe six hours of training or something. Most of it consisted of the guards mm -hmm. saying how the women will try to con you. I mean, it was nothing. And yes. I just went in and uh -huh. I made up my own curriculum right. and I taught a writing class. And that's how I began. And it changed me. The search changed me, Toby. Yes, yes. I love that. I love that. That is so powerful. So is there a question you'd like um, to ask? How me? did you start getting into the podcast after you, um, you know, got out of prison and everything? So, you know, I felt there was this whole incident I had while I was on suicide watch where I felt like, you know, God had come and told me that I needed to tell my story because it would help other women. And so I knew I was going to write a book. I knew I had to write a book because I was kind of told I needed to. And so I'd been working on a book for a long time. And I published my book in June of 2022, so a year ago. And I was like, oh, yay, that's done. I'm done. But I started getting so many, you know, invitations to do interviews and to tell my story. And, and I realized I'm not done yet. And then my publisher said, Toby, you really need to start your own podcast. And I said, podcast, where'd that come from? And within the week, I had come up with a title and was and and purchased the software I needed. And when I was off and um, I really my my mission really is to open people's minds to give them stories and conversations about things that they haven't thought about so that they can broaden their own uh, experiences and maybe be, find a way that they can make a difference well, you know, in the world, you too. Well, you know, you so comfortable. That they I can just do. really want to go out to lunch with you now. <laughs> hey, I'd love that. I might have to come to Boston so we can do that. <laughs> it's only a short yeah. little train ride, so... Who knows? I'll let okay. you know if I come to Boston okay. again. We'll, we'll, we'll get together. Yeah. I think that'd be great. So what's one word that inspires you? Persistence. Persistence. That is so good. You know, we can make anything happen if we just don't well, ever quit you know, trying, right? I am a great believer in talent. But I am a greater believer in trudging through all of what you have to trudge through to get yourself mm -hmm. out there or to get messages out there, to help people get mm -hmm. messages out there, all of the above. And I think if you don't have the belief that you can do things and the belief that that you're important and and that you deserve to keep going and keep trying oh, and so on. If you don't do that, it won't happen. You know, nobody can do it for you. You're right. You know, and I think the harder of a journey you have to get something out there, the more beautiful it's going to be because it's that coming up against a, a roadblock and finding a way through it and around it that makes your idea your mission your project so much i think stronger. about it also you know like i swim every day not every day i swim three or four times a week mm -hmm. i do a lot of exercise and i'm not a young woman anymore mm -hmm. but i i um i swim and i'm slow but i swim that three quarters mm -hmm. of a mile i do it i do it i do it and when I'm done, I feel mm -hmm. great. It doesn't feel so good when I'm doing it. It feels kind of awful. Some of my body mm -hmm. are, and to get there, you know, just to get out of the house. It, but it's such a good metaphor for, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking up the things that are hard. Mm -hmm. I love that taking up things that are hard. 
I don't think we should shy away from the hard things or the hard conversations because that's yeah, really and where I the think power it's is, really think, important, Toby, to listen heart. to people who have been through. That's one of the things that I impresses me about you. But Carter too. Carter is now, um, mm-hmm. he's the head of an organization in Massachusetts or a co-chair in which I am a member, which is mm-hmm. a thrilling experience. Oh, how for me. cool! And <laughs> yeah, I mm-hmm. me too. And I, I love think, that. You know, this whole notion of people who have been at the table having a voice in incarceration issues is exactly the truth. And, um, you know, more the more we can get voices. I mean, I hope that you can talk to people behind bars because they also, I wish you could do that more and more. You know, it's hard, but I think I would love to help you facilitate a conversation with somebody behind bars. I would love that. I would be so willing to do that. Um, I actually love people in prison. I mean, I think they have some of the relationships mean everything to them. And, you know, I just really admire the best ideas, too, about Um, how things change. Yeah. Yes, they do. They certainly do. I would love that. So I'd be happy to do anything if you can facilitate something. I've always been a little hesitant because... You know, I was a prison volunteer oh, yeah. and I did help someone escape. Now it's been 17 years ago, but, and I've done so much different type of work now. I would think if someone looked at me as a whole, they would say I wasn't an is- a risk, but I haven't That's really a good point, though. gotten That's out there a good and point. tried. Especially so. in, in Virginia, mm-hmm. God knows. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But I have gotten involved in a lot of uh, reentry work and mentoring groups in the Washington, D.C. area. So, you know, I, I think there's opportunities. So I just need to reach out for them, I think. So, Jean, thank you so much for being on with me today. I've so enjoyed our conversation. And I will definitely be putting a trip to Boston into my schedule in the next year or so. So we can get together and have lunch. I think that'd be awesome. Thanks for having me. I've loved it. You're welcome. Thank you. I just want to close with a couple of paragraphs from your book, Shakespeare Behind Bars, that really touched my soul. While it is true that prison is a repressive environment, the one who offers hope in the classroom has the potential to affect change. The women of Framingham sought a way out, and their struggles gave them dignity. I could hear their voices speaking out of the darkness. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for joining me on Fierce Conversations with Toby. Your support and listening means so much to me, and I hope today's conversation makes a difference in your world. If you would like to support this podcast, there are many ways to do so. I found these ways tend to help the most in getting our message out into the world. Number one, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to or watch this podcast. If you can leave a five-star rating or a like on this episode on YouTube, that helps even more. And if you leave a comment or a review, that helps the most. The next way you can support Fierce Conversations with Toby is to join our Patreon, at patreon.com slash fierce conversations. All tiers come with a downloadable digital gratitude journal created by me and membership in a private Facebook group that I also lead. Most importantly, 10% of all proceeds from your subscription will go directly to donating my workbooks to women in prison. Finally, sharing the link to this show with your friends, family, and anyone who wants to listen is appreciated more than I can say. Thank you again for joining me today and supporting this show by listening to it and sharing it with friends. Fierce Conversations is created and hosted by me, Toby Dore, produced by Number 3 Productions. The theme song that you're hearing now, Groovin', was composed and arranged by Lisa Plass. Lisa also plays the flute for the theme with Carolyn Parody on piano and Tony Ventura on bass. Find out more at tobydore.com. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby. Escape your prison.